All right. So osmoregulation in sharks, skates, and rays. So these guys live in the ocean, and the ocean is salty, right? There's lots of salts in the water, 35 parts per thousand. Um, and so anything that lives in salt water is going to have to maintain some sort of salt water balance, right? Between the water and their internal um, solutes and stuff that are in their body. So they have to maintain some sort of salt water balance. Uh, so the way that they're going to do that is going to be different um, than different kinds of animals. And in chondrixes, we're going to talk about that today. But um, as we talk about this, you do need to know um, and be able to compare the difference between how chondrixes maintains osmoregulation and then osteoxes does, which is what we'll talk about next cycle. So we'll talk about next cycle how um, osteoxes maintains their salt water balance. So you'll need to compare the chondrixes and osteoxes, osteoxes in this way. All right? So you'll need to compare them in several ways. This is one of them. All right, make sure that you know the difference between these two. Okay, so do you remember last semester how we talked about osmosis? And then we talked about like how water is going to move towards where there's more salt, right? So if you're an animal and you're living in water and there's more salt in the water than in your body, what's going to happen? Water is going to move out, right? And your cells are going to shrivel up and they're going to, you're going to die, right? So you have to maintain some sort of balance to make sure that you have enough water in your cells so that you don't die, because dying is bad, okay? So you need to maintain that balance. How animals like sharks and skates and rays do this is they actually maintain a balance um, with the water that is like a salt water balance that is either equal to or greater than the surrounding seawater. Meaning, guys, meaning that the amount of salt and water that are in the cell is either equal or greater, uh, the salt concentration is either equal or greater than the water salt concentrations outside in the water. <laughs> that is way too hard to say. Um, does that make sense? So that means that if it's equal to, the concentrations are equal, Cody, what's going to happen? Okay, where's the water going to move? Um, if they're equal? Okay, it's going to be an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should listen. Um, so they're going to be in equilibrium, so the water will move equally back and forth, right? It's going to be happy. Yay, everything's wonderful. Okay, um, or greater than, so if they have a more salt inside of their body, then what's going to happen? Which way is the water going to move? If, if water's going to move in, right? If they have more salt inside of their body, yes? So if they've got more salt in, water's going to move in. Okay, so that's good because that means you're either equal to that water or you you got a little bit more wa uh, salt, so you're going to gain some water. And gaining water is easy to get rid of if you've got the right structures, right? Okay, so that's good. How do they actually maintain this uh, solute concentration that is either equal to or greater than the salt water? Well, the way that they do that is um, interesting. They actually retain large amounts of nitrogenous waste. What does that mean? Well, they maintain this chemical in their body called urea. Uh, urea is a product of like your metabolism. So when your cells break down your food and use energy and stuff, they produce urea. And normally your kidneys filter that out and it goes out in your urine, okay? And you pee it out. Um, sharks and skates and rays uh, will actually maintain some of that urea in their muscle tissues and in their tissues rather than filtering it out. So by having that urea in their tissues, it allows for their like solute concentration to be equal to the salt water. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so they're able to maintain those nitrogenous waste and um, have an equal or greater than salt balance. They also can retain another type of nitrogenous waste. It's called TMAO or trimethylamine oxide. Um, but you mostly just need to know urea. All right. Uh, having that urea in the muscle tissue and stuff can actually make like shark meat not taste as good and stuff. So, um, so sharks can also gain salt other ways. So like when they eat, right, when they take a bite out of something, they're probably going to swallow some salt water with that meal because they're living in salt water and opening their mouth underwater. Um, so they're going to be swallowing some water. Um, any sort of like salt that's in there that you know is excess and that they don't need 
they actually have ways to get rid of that salt. So they're going to have like chloride cell cells in their gills that are going to like get rid of salt back into the water. Um, also, like their kidneys will filter out any excess salt okay, and um, get rid of those in their urine. And then they al they've also got a rectal gland. Okay, so they've, uh, and you saw that in your dissection, right? It's a little kind of like thing at the end near the cloaca. Um, that little rectal gland will actually help filter any excess salts out and stick the excess salts like into the intestine. And then that excess salt would be excreted. Okay, <clears throat> so chimera. Chimera are one of the types of animals that you'd actually find in chondrichthys. Okay, so we're going to actually now take and look at the different kinds of animals you would find in chondrichthys. Um, chimera is one of them. They're weird looking. You can see a picture of them on the screen. Um, they're, they've got lots of other common names that you may hear. They're the rat tail fish, the rat fish, the rabbit fish, the chimera. There's all sorts of different ones. Um, they are deeper sea fish, and you can tell that by their eyes. So if you look at their eyes, they have big eyes. And uh, those are used for like staying in low light conditions. So they actually live deeper in the water. They're closer to the benthic region. They are going to be moving around in the deep sea, trying to find food. Uh, they get their name from this big, long rat-like tail. Uh, the tail will actually extend back. You can't actually see it in this picture, but it extends back. And it's like a long, skinny tail that looks like a rat's tail. So that's why they get their name, the rat tail fish. They have claspers, just like other chondrichthys, but they, it's a little bit weird for them. So they actually have five claspers total. So they have four claspers, uh, if they're a male, on their pelvic fins, and then they've got one clasper on their head, wow. okay, in order to be able to hold on to the female and to mate. Okay, so yeah, it is, it's interesting. The, another difference between them and other chondrichthys is they actually ha just have one pair of gill slits. Okay, like one gill opening rather than the five or to seven. Right, so you saw in your shark dissection how it has five slits on either side, yeah? Okay, so this guy only has got one and it's going to be like right there. All right, does that make sense? Mostly I just want you to know that these exist just in case like you hear anything about them, okay? All right. Um, we're going to take a brief moment to talk about some shark conservation issues and like other issues for conservation in chondrichthys uh, because this is actually incredibly important and relevant and um, it's going to be if something doesn't happen we're going to have some serious issues so as we talked about when we did our uh, shark they said our shark worksheet we looked and we said okay not all sharks are killers really there's only four ish um, species of sharks that are actually going to be responsible for any sort of attack on humans, right? Out of 370 different species. Yeah, there's four main ones like the bull shark, the oceanic white tip, the great white, and the tiger shark. But then you've also got like the fan tiger shark that is known to attack people sometimes, rarely. Um, and then maybe the blue shark. Okay, so, uh, but four mostly. And really, um, there are some attacks, but not very many people are actually killed by sharks every year. Um, they kill maybe like three people a year, and w if they do, it's very, it's most likely mistaken identity, so they're not gonna know, and then that you're not their food, uh, and then so they'll bite you, get big teeth, and typically like you you die from bleeding out or something like that. Okay, um, you're actually it's interesting. You're actually more likely to be killed by a vending machine tipping over on you than you are by a shark attack, okay? And cows. Actually, there's a lot of different things that you are more likely to get killed by than a shark. So let's look at 20 different things that you're more likely to get killed by than a shark. Okay, so deer kill 130 people every year either by like you know you hit them in your car and they cause like a big old car accident and people die or like hunting accidents that sort of thing okay obesity being fat kills 30,000 people every year you're more likely to die of obesity lightning strikes
kill 10,000 people a year. You're more likely to be struck by lightning and die than you are to be killed by a shark. Okay? Cell phone while driving. This number's probably gone up. But it causes about 6,000 6, deaths per year. So people with distracted driving. Okay? Hippos cause about 2,900 deaths per year. So hippos in Africa kill lots of people. Look at those teeth. Those are big teeth. Okay. Hippos are hippos are sketchy. Volcanoes cause 845 deaths a year. Okay. From eruptions or like yeah, gases, stuff like that. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Um, people doing weird things while they have sex kills about 600 people a year. Yep. That's messed up. Okay, sell off. So like, guys, yeah. So like people getting trampled in big sales and stuff like that kills about 550 people per year. Falling out of bed kills 450 people a year. Old people or babies, stuff like that, falling out of bed. Yeah. Bathtub kill 340 people a year. That's scary. Or like even people moving bathtubs and bathtubs falling on people can kill people. Okay. Uh, deer again, I don't know why that's twice. Stalactites kill 100 people per year. You guys know what a stalactite is? Yeah, these are, those are like the spiky things that hang off the ceiling of caves. So those fall on people and impale people and kill people. Yeah. Hot dogs. Still 80 kids a year. Because they choke on them. They choke on them. Yeah, they're so, they're, it's, you're, yeah. Tornadoes kill 60 people a year. Jellyfish kill 40 people a year. Dogs kill 30 people a year. Now that dog probably didn't kill anybody, but they still do. Ants kill 30 people a year. No, there's like crazy ants in um, crazy ants like in post in tropical areas like bullet ants that have hugely painful crazy things and bites and stuff so they it's they supposedly cause like excruciating pain so american football kills 20 people a year okay <laughs> soda machines kill 13 people a year you know yeah like if you're yeah, like if your drink doesn't come out, and so they're like, I want my drink, and then it falls out. <laughs> and like it just falls on them. <laughs> Roller coasters kill six people a year, and sharks kill maybe five people a year. Okay, so there's a lot of things that you are more likely to die from than sharks. Okay, so. Sharks get a bad rep, but there's lots of things that you do every day that are much more, much more dangerous, like driving to school. Okay, it's much more dangerous to you than actually um, getting attacked by a shark. America does have the most amount of shark attacks every year, followed by Australia, um, probably because we have more coastline, like miles, than Australia. Okay. However, so. You are much more likely to get killed by a lot of other things than sharks. Um, sharks kill maybe five people a year, guys. Um, but we kill over 100 million sharks a year for this practice called shark finning. Okay? So, hold on, and I will explain it to you. So, here's what happens. Here's what happens. They um, capture sharks and they cut off their fins, okay? Because the fins are used in shark fin soup in many Asian countries, okay? So um, shark fin soup is considered to be like a status symbol. So if you are able to serve like shark fin soup at your wedding, it means that you're really, really rich, okay? Um, and so they will kill, they kill sharks and cut off their fins, be, be, use those fins in shark fin soup. 
And as the economy in China and uh, Asian countries has improved, it, more people are richer, and so the demand for shark fin soup has increased. What they do is they take those fins, they dry them out, um, and then those fins get ground up into powder, and then those get put into the soup. Um, and really, they actually don't serve like any function like for taste. So it doesn't actually alter the taste of the soup. What it does is it actually uh, acts more of like makes it more of like a gel-like consistency than like liquidy. Uh, so it really just increases the consistency of the soup. And honestly, there's like a lot of other things that can do that, right? Um, you don't need the shark fins. So what happens is um, the fins are what are really, really valuable uh, on the shark. So they'll capture the shark and just cut off their fins, keep the fins and toss the rest of the shark back into the water. So the dead or dying shark is now like in the water, just like sinking back down. It can't swim, it's not gonna survive, it's bleeding out. Um, and so the shark dies. And because now, because they've actually, we kill 100 million sharks a year, they um, are going after other things like rays and stuff like that that have the fins, the big like fins as well. So we're, that's crazy. Um, what happens? When you take out the top predator of any ecosystem, there's more prey. And then what do the prey eat more of? Their algae or their prey, right? And so what eventually happens to that ecosystem? It dies away. It like basically collapses, right? So if we take out the top predator of the ocean, what's going to happen to the ecosystem of the ocean? It's going to, yeah, like we're going we're gonna to be in big trouble, okay? So it is actually a huge deal. Um, shark, fin, shark finning is banned in U.S. waters, but um, in other places it's not. So if you ever see legislation for shark fin, whatever, um, vote yes for it to stop shark finning and save the sharks. Okay. Um, you can see here, there's a picture of the um, shark, like the pieces of shark. So there's all sorts of fins, and then here's like the dead shark with the their fins are cut off. Okay. Um, and they do that, they do that so um, because the fins are the valuable part, and if you just keep the fins and toss the rest of the shark back in, um, you have more space for more fins, right? So they keep the fins and toss the shark back in. Um, in certain areas of the world, you can have shark meat will actually be sold as the fish and fish and chips, okay? Um, so it just depends. They also, so in some Eastern medicines, they'll also use um, like <laughs> the cartilage, so from the shark skeleton, uh, to treat like joint problems, because they think, oh, you know, there's cartilage in your joints, so if you eat cartilage, that must help your joints, right? It's not exactly how your body works. Um, we know that now, but um, it's still a predominant belief, so people, you know, will use shark cartilage and stuff to try and treat joint problems. And they also think that it'll prevent cancer because they don't, you don't see sharks in the wild with cancer. So they think it prevents cancer. So the problem with taking out 100 million sharks a year is that sharks grow and reproduce very slowly. So it may take 15 years for a shark to reach sexual maturity and be able to reproduce. If you take that shark out and like kill it, take its fins before it ever gets a chance to reproduce, it doesn't get the chance to replace itself. Okay, so it's gonna, it's it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. So now that now you know, and uh, as you turn 18 and are able to vote, vote to, pick for, to ban shark fin, shark finning. Okay, specimen spotlight on the great white shark because the great white shark is cool. Okay, it is awesome. So the great white shark is responsible for most of the um, shark attacks that occur worldwide every year. So about a third to half of the, great, the shark attacks that occur are because of a great white shark. It is the largest predatory fish on Earth. Okay, so the great white shark can get up to like 20 feet, maybe a little bit bigger, but uh, the megalodon's dead. But they get up to 20 feet, okay? The females will get larger. Um, then the males, they average about 15 feet. But they can get bigger. Um, they do have about 300 teeth in their mouth at any given time, and they are on the endangered species list. Okay, so, because we kill so many of them a year. Um, you can see the picture right here. Uh, you can see the comparison of a great white shark to a bus. 
so it's about half the size of a bus. So they're big, and like I'll admit, they're scary. Like nobody wants to see a great white shark when you're in the water. They're scary. Okay. I would be scared. Um, they so they're really really good at detecting blood in the water. So they can detect blood up to three miles away. Okay, that's that's far. That's a long ways. Um, and they can detect about one drop of blood in 25 gallons of water. So just one single drop in 25 gallons, they can detect that up to three miles away. So it's crazy. And you can see in that picture uh, where the great white shark is actually found. The yellow is where they're found. The yellow is where they're found, yeah. So they pretty much live everywhere um, except for the polar regions. Okay? Yeah. And like they're, I mean, they're known to travel long distances. They migrate really, really far. They tracked one great white shark that went from like Australia all the way over to South America and then back in like nine months. So they're swimming a lot and far and fast. Okay. Um, finding food. And they, there's like a this place called Sofa. So it's uh, it's like the, an offshore feeding area. And it's like off the shore of like South America over here that great white sharks tend to go to. We don't really know why. We're still trying to figure that out. But they tend to go over here and then they will migrate back. Um, so it just depends. Probably finding food. And then they have scary bites. OK, skates and rays. Other types of chondrixies that you'll find. Um, skates and rays. These are flattened dorsal ventrally, right? So top and bottom squished together. Um, and they mostly are benthic, so they're mostly going to live on the bottom. Bless you. But you do have some exceptions to that rule. So, like the manta ray, the d largest type of ray, um, is going to be pelagic, so it's going to be swimming up in the water column. Okay? And like the spotted eagle ray will be pelagic, swimming in the water. Um, but for for the most part, they're going to be benthic, resting on the bottom. I'm going to let you copy this down, and then I'm going to show you a picture so that you can see it. So they're flattened dorsal eventually, um, and they're pectoral fins. The pectoral fins of a ray are enlarged and fused to their head. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, I'm going to scroll down so you can see this. Okay, so if this is my shark here on the left, Right? So that's what it looks like from the side. Bless you. And then this is what it would look like from the top, right? And then those are its pectoral fins, yes? Okay. Um, if you, for a ray, okay, if you take those pectoral fins and you enlarge them um, and then like attach them to the head, right, like that, that, those are its pectoral fins. Okay. And then the actual body part of the ray is in the middle. Does that make sense? Okay. And then it's got like this long whip like tail that comes out the back. Okay. Um, so it's got big and large pectoral fins. If this is the top of the ray, you'll see like the eyes will be on the top of the ray, but the mouth and the gill slits are on the underside. Okay, so they're on the underneath, the ventral side. They'd be on the other side. Um, and so rays have a benthic existence, so they sit like with their mouth and their gill slits in the sand. Does that make sense? And then their eyes are on the top. And they're looking around. Okay. In order to prevent um, their gills from getting like all nasty and full of like sand and stuff, because remember as we talked about chondrixes, um, we talked about how like they bring water in through their mouth and then it passes over their gills and out their gill slits. Okay, well a ray has its mouth and its gill slits in the dirt, right? So if it were to do that, it'd be taking in all sorts of like dirt and sand and water and then passing that over its gills. That would be bad, yeah? Um, if it just did that perpetually. So what they actually have are these things called spiracles that are behind the eyes. Okay, so up here, and you saw them in your shark dissection. They're behind the eyes, okay? Um, and what it does is it allows for them to have their mouth in the sand. The spiracles pull water in, and then the water comes in and then goes over the gills and out the gill slit. So it prevents uh, what we call fouling, or making, like, getting the gills all full of crap, basically. Does that make sense? Okay, so the spiracles allow for them to be able to do that. And some sharks that will have like a benthic existence too, like the spiny dogfish shark, if it spends any time on the bottom, it'll have spiracles. Okay, so what is the difference between a skate and a ray? Um, this is your chart in your notes. 
So skates are on the left, rays are on the right. Skates are oviparous, meaning they lay eggs. Okay. And rays are going to be viviparous, so they're going to give live birth and the mother is going to directly nourish the young. Yes, so cute. Skates are also going to have a dorsal fin. Okay, so on their tails they'll have a dorsal fin, whereas rays will not have a dorsal fin at all. Um, rays are going to have a venomous spine, where skates will not. Skates will have like a thorny back that they will use um, for protection, whereas rays will actually have like a stinging spine. Um, rays tend to be larger, skates are smaller, okay? And then the way that they swim is different. So rays will swim by moving their fins up and down, so they'll flap their fins, um, whereas skates will actually start and create like this ripple effect, um, starting at the front of their pectoral fins and then moving that ripple um, along to the back of their fins. So they'll swim like that, whereas rays will flap. Okay, so you can see um, the two. So here's a skate, here's a ray. Um, here's like the little dorsal fin on the tail of the skate and the ray won't have one of those. Um, and then also uh, some skates will actually have like caudal fins at the back, whereas rays won't. Okay. You can see the spherical behind the eye. Yeah, does that difference make sense? All right, so here's what a stingray spine actually looks like. Okay, um, pretty pretty crazy. That is in their tail, okay, and um, they can regenerate it. So if they sting something for protection and it breaks off, they can grow it back. Uh, that's why, like at the aquarium where you were able to touch the rays, they they trim those spines to make sure that they can't actually sting you. Um, but that's what it looks like. Notice these backward facing barbs. Yeah, you see that. So that means that when this comes into you, what's going to happen as it goes out? Yeah, it's going to tear and it's going to be like not good. Yeah, so those backwards facing barbs create like a bigger wound essentially and do all sorts of damage. Um, and so, and some you can get stung by a stingray and, you know, maybe get a piece of that spine broken off um, and then have to have it removed. So, Rays will use this for um, defense. So if they feel threatened, they'll whip their tail up and then that tail will have this spine in it that they will use to stab and um, hurt you and defend themselves. So here's like kind of an animation, not an animation, a picture for you. So here's like the stingray spine and then if you step on them, this is what, how you get stung. So that tail whips up with that spine and it stings your ankle. Huh? Yeah, it's like, it's like attached right there. They, it typically has like some skin over it or and then when it pops up then it the skin will not be on it. Um, so that that's why like you get stung. Right? They say so if you're at a beach and you see a sign that looks like this, so it says like May to October, okay? It says shuffle your feet or you'll do the stingray hop. What that means um, is that if you're walking like in the water, right? Uh, so rays will, are benthic, so they'll actually like cover themselves in sand so you can't see them, right? So they say that um, if you're walking in the water, you need to like drag your feet, because as you drag your feet, that actually like gives the ray warning that you're coming, and so it'll sense that you're coming and it'll swim away. Whereas if you just walk normally, you step on the ray, and you get stung, and you do the stingray hop, which is like, ow, 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 right? I got stung by a ray, okay? So do the stingray shuffle or you'll be doing the stingray hop. And apparently it's like super painful to be stung by a stingray. I've never been stung by a stingray, but it's supposed to hurt like crazy. And their venom can actually make it so that the wound takes a while to heal, right? So it can take like a couple months to heal, right? So, or longer. Um, let me show you video. Yeah, Steve Irwin. So Steve Irwin um, was stung by a stingray. That spine pierced his heart. 
Okay, um, really what happened was kind of what you saw in that last video where they had, they were like filming, and so the cameraman was kind of in front, and then like Steve Irwin was kind of above the ray, and then there was like another person. Um, so the ray felt trapped, uh, and it doesn't like to feel trapped, and so it brought its tail up to like defend itself, and it stung Steve Irwin in the heart. And um, yeah, probably one of the reasons why he did actually end up dying from that was because he pulled it out. Uh, so there was actually like three months later, an 80-year-old man had the same thing happen to him, and he survived because he left it in and got to the hospital. Uh, so it's possible to survive. But I mean, what's your natural reaction when you get stabbed by something? <laughs> to pull it out, right? Um, if you get stabbed in the heart, I mean, you bleed to death in like four minutes. So it's crazy.